Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Visser. I'm the Head of Research and Evaluation in the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. I'm really delighted to be here today and to welcome you to this launch of the, our Disrupted Transitions uh, report. Um, in my role in the department, I'm very involved in the Growing Up in Ireland study, so we're really excited about this report. Not only is it the sixth report under our partnership with the ESRI, which is obviously a really valuable resource to us in terms of generating uh, policy relevant research, but also I think we're here today because of the commitment of the GUI study team in the ESRI and Trinity and indeed our partners in the Central Statistics Office who really availed of the opportunity in December 2020 to capture what the COVID uh, interruptions meant for this cohort. And at that time, we spoke to 12-year-olds and their parents, as well as the 22-year-olds who are featured in this report. And it really speaks to the value of longitudinal research because GUI is the only way to link that experience to where those young people had come from. Uh, and we'd collected data from them when they were 20. And indeed at the moment, we're getting ready to collect data again from them when they're 25 next year. So we'll be able to take another look at what has been the medium term impacts of these experiences. Um, so it really speaks to what's possible uh, with such a comprehensive longitudinal study. Um, we have a very full hour ahead of us, so I'm not going to say much more than that. I'm delighted we have the Minister to launch the report, and then we're going to hear from the authors, Emer Smith and Anne Nolan. And then finally, Keith Moynes is joining us from the Department of Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation and Science. And he's going to look at some of the policy implications from, from their perspective. So we are tight on time, so I'd encourage everyone to put any questions into the Q&A function. Uh, the authors have agreed to keep an eye on that as we go, um, and we'll certainly get through as many of those questions as we possibly can before we finish up at one o'clock. Uh, so Minister, over to you. That's great, Anna. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much and uh, good, good afternoon to, to everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to, to be here to, to speak to the, the launch of this report. I'd like to thank Emer and Anne for asking me to launch it. Uh, obviously, it's the most recent report from the department and the SRI partnership uh, the Disrupted Transitions, Young Adults and the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, and I'm, uh, as Anna said, it's the sixth such report that's been generated. Uh, and I think it provides very important, um, I suppose, insights for policymakers in terms of the experiences of young people in Ireland generally, but particularly uh, post the uh, pandemic. Uh, and as, as Anna said, the report uses the Growing Up in Ireland Longitudinal Study of Children and Young People, uh, which is now 16 years in operation. Uh, and this report draws on a survey that was conducted in January of 2020, right in the midst of the pandemic. And it was a survey of 2,377 young adults in the older Growing Up in Ireland cohort. Uh, and most of them were 22 years of age at the time of that uh, study. Uh, and I think it very much speaks to the, the dedication and the uh, agility of the study team that they were able to pivot from face to face surveys to online survey format and very quickly plan this survey, which was an unforeseen one, uh, but at the same time ensure that the really valuable data that was collected would be uh, would, would be obtained. Uh, and I really would like to thank all the young people who participated in this survey, who gave their time to answer the online survey at, I think, a, a, as we all know, was a, a very difficult time for us. December 2020, we were nine months into the pandemic at this stage. It was a stage when um, restrictions were easing, but of course, as we know, we were about to enter into another prolonged period of uh, closure. Closures and the generosity of young people with their time is hugely va valuable um, for policymakers, for government, re government and researchers, because it allows us to, uh, I suppose, obtain uh, contemporaneous data and evidence on the impact of the pandemic on people's lives. And this data is also of interest to wider society and I, even, you know, future historians, as it provides the detail of life in the pandemic not in retrospect, but as it was experienced at that time. And of course, the key value, the key, um, the, the, the key principle behind GUI is that it is longitudinal. Uh, and as we learn today, this will allow us to link what we learned about their COVID experiences uh, to the lives of these young people before the pandemic. But also, uh, and quite importantly, we are now preparing to collect data from these young people next year when they are 25. 
And from that, we will be able to learn about the ongoing impacts of the COVID experience on their lives. Reading this report has given plenty of time to consider uh, in terms of policy and, and, and service planning. And Emer and Anne will inform us in more detail of some of the important findings of this report. But I wanted to use my time this afternoon to reflect on some of the inf insights that I found particularly striking uh, and how they are going to guide our policies uh, aimed at improving the lives of uh, young people uh, and particularly young adults in Ireland today. And I think in particular, I want to place a focus on the mental health dimensions of the report. Uh, look, I, I think we all know the importance of the early 20s for young people. It's a particularly critical uh, period of someone's development. It's a period of discovery. Many young people have a lot of new experiences. They meet new people. Uh, they find their own tribe of like-minded people in terms of education, work, or, or, or leisure. Um, it's also a period of time when a lot of young people maybe first flex their independence, uh, living outside of the family home for the first time, earning their own money. Uh, but the pandemic uh, very significantly curbs these rites of passage and transitions, and that's been particularly tough for this age group. Um, and the report is very clear that the pandemic has led to poorer mental health among young adults. And the findings in this regard are stark. They reveal 40% of 22-year-old men and over half, 55% of 22-year-old women, were classified as experiencing depressive symptoms. And these were much higher figures than the two years previously, when 22% of men and 31% of women experienced depressive symptoms. And this increase in poorer mental health reflected the disruption to young people's education, training, and that shift to remote learning. And regarding the report, it also makes it very clear how important social interaction is for young people's well-being. And it shows that reduced contact with friends was linked to increased depression for young women. And spending less time on, on sport and less time outdoors were linked to higher depression rates among young men. And the report also points to factors that protected against depression. And again, these were different for men and women, though both groups clearly find solace in friendship and communal activity. And these insights are very useful for government and for practitioners in terms of designing strategies and very targeted interventions. And supporting positive mental health is a key priority uh, for government. And, and this is particularly the case as it's clear that the pandemic did adversely affect young people's mental health. And we still don't fully understand the, the, the overall impact of COVID-19 on mental health or indeed the extent of subsequent supports that will be required uh, or how long this may affect longer term demand for services. And this is why growing up in our, the Growing Up in Ireland survey on the same young people next year when this group of young people are 25 will be so important in terms of giving us an insight into that ongoing, that longer term uh, COVID experience in young people's lives. However, if we are to set about responding to, to this challenge in a cohesive way, we can rebuild lost ground and also make sure that for future initiatives are informed by the lessons that we've learned. And Budget 2022 provided unprecedented funding of over 1, mil, 1 billion euro for HSE's mental health, which was an increase on 47 million euro on the 2021 figure. And this includes funding of 3.5 million to uh, expand the capacity of community mental health teams. And funding provided by government this year includes 10 million for initiatives aimed at increasing mental health supports in response to the pandemic, including enhanced signposting and access to existing mental health services and supports, initiatives for children, young people and students, and additional psychosocial responses, recognizing that people will require varying levels of support. And a further 10 million euro is available in once off funding to improve the experiences of individuals, including children and young people accessing specialist mental health services, in addition to community and voluntary mental supports. And this includes 1 million for my mind to deliver approximately 16,500 free of charge talk therapy sessions to people impacted neg negatively by the COVID-19 pandemic. And the findings of this report also highlight the potential for broader health promotion initiatives in relation to diet, physical activity, smoking, drinking, and uh, the ability of these initiatives to have positive spillover impacts on mental health and well-being. 
And in this regard, it's important, important to point out that significant additional funding has been provided to the HSE throughout the pandemic for mental health promotion, well-being campaigns, and enhanced online supports to improve population health outcomes. In my own department, it was very clear during the pandemic that the social interaction provided by youth clubs and their ability to pivot to online supports was hugely important. And in recognition of the vital role played by youth work in providing such support to young people, the youth funding provided by my department was increased in both Budget 2021 and Budget 2022 to bring the annual youth funding, including capital allocations, to 73 million euro per year. And this has enabled the youth sector to continue to provide support to young people, particularly to marginalised, disadvantaged and vulnerable young people. And work is also currently underway in my department in relation to the next policy framework for better outcomes, brighter futures, the national policy framework for children and young people 2023 to 2028. There's a particular concern which reflects the findings of this report that there is an increasing percentage of young people who could have mental health problems. And it's paramount that this next policy framework addresses the mental health of our young people. And to do this, we need to improve the impact. Uh, we need to address the impact of the pandemic. And to assist us, the National Advisory Council, established under Better Outcomes, Brighter Futures, has been asked to examine the issue and identify potential actions under the framework. The Council harnesses expertise and experience from the community and voluntary sector, from academia and from uh, independent experts. And this report will have a, be, be a key input into that deliberation. So look, in order to be brief, I focus my speech on the government's recent in initiatives aimed at addressing the mental health of our young people. And this report, however, has, finding, has relevant findings for all government departments. And I know that later Keith will be speaking from the perspective of policy impact in terms of further and higher education, which is a, a, a really valuable take. And the report helps us to understand life as lived by young people during the pandemic, but it also has insights which have a, a universal relevance. And it shows us the importance of connection, of access to education, of job stability, and of supporting young adults as they make key transitions. So it's important that in our desire to return to life without restriction, re without restrictions, we take stock of those lessons and insights and respond in an, in an informed manner to the challenges which our young people face. And this report can assist us in this exercise of deliberation, reflection and action. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this in interesting webinar. And finally, again, sincere thanks to Emer Smith and Anne Nolan for their work in creating this, this really valuable publication. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you very much for joining us and launching the report. And it's something we've been looking forward to for, for some time, but also drawing out those connections between the wider issues, not just the experience of the pandemic, but also the, the kind of range of challenges that young people are, are facing today. And I think you're going to go first in terms of the, the presentation, and then you'll hand over to Emer for, for, part of, for part of the report. So I'll hand straight over to you. Thank you very much, um, Anna, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you also to the minister. Um, I think uh, both Anna and uh, the minister really set the scene um, very well for what I'm going to talk about today, which is we'll bring you through some of the detail, uh, detailed findings uh, from the report that um, the minister has launched. Uh, Emer is going to take over for the second half, but uh, I'll start off first. So. Um, I suppose it's uh, well rehearsed at this stage, but the, the COVID pandemic uh, was a major shock to every aspect um, of our lives. Um, so to our social lives, economic lives, and for this cohort as well, for their educational uh, experiences. Um, and as the minister uh, very eloquently put it, um, I think there's a, there's a key concern around this age group in particular. If we, if we think about, you know, if I think back to when I was 22, this is a time when major life uh, transitions are taking place. Uh, many of these young people were making the transition from further or higher education into the world of work and starting their careers. Uh, many of them also uh, were moving out of the family home and you know, starting up independent households. And they're also forming uh, relationships and sort of deepening their relationships with their peers, which are really important at this age group. Um, and at the early stages of the pandemic, um, uh, we were really, I suppose, sort of struggling to, to figure out what the real sort of major policy concerns would be. Um, and the department um, uh, sponsored and um, uh, supported the SRI in carrying out research on sort of the early impacts of the pandemic. 
Uh, and I suppose there was a couple of things that came um, out of that piece of research. Um, the first was really that a lot of the evidence or the emerging evidence that was coming out had very much focused on young people uh, and their families. And, you know, we can obviously think of the reasons why um, it's a key concern to think about uh, young people um, of those ages. Uh, but I suppose the second issue that came across very strongly was that a lot of the emerging evidence was based on sort of convenient samples or samples that weren't representative of the populations that were being studied. So there was a real gap in the evidence base. Uh, and this is where the department uh, came in um, and, and supported the collection of additional data from the Growing Up in Ireland study, as Anna and the minister both mentioned, having that span of longitudinal data before, during, and then, as we know, we'll have the data after the pandemic as well, is really sort of the only source of, of useful data that we'll be able to use in terms of devising policy responses. Um, so the data that we're going to talk to you today about um, is from uh, the 98 cohort. Um, so this is the survey um, of the 98 cohort that was carried out um, in December of 2020. And the aim of this was really to, to sort of plug that evidence gap uh, in terms of the sort of policy needs around um, the pandemic. So just to give you a bit of background then on the COVID-19 surveys, and um, they were carried out with both cohorts, but I'm really going to focus on obviously on the 98 cohort um, uh, in this presentation. Um, so for the first time, we moved to a web-based uh, survey um, for obvious reasons during the pandemic. Um, and because of that, it obviously had to be much shorter um, than the usual face-to-face -face interactions that we have with our respondents. Um, so there was a short window for completion in December of 2020. Um, and if you think back to then, that coincided with the pre-Christmas 2020 easing of restrictions. So things like restaurants um, were starting to open, there was more socialising and more household visiting um, was allowed. Um, so at this age, most of the cohort 98 were 22 years of age at the time of the survey. Um, because it was a web-based survey, obviously the response rate, um, we expected it to be lower than the usual sort of face-to-face -face, uh, interactions. We had a response rate of, of just around a third, um, uh, but the data here that I'm showing you and that Emer is presenting as well, it's all related to account for this um, attrition um, and sort of differential response across different uh, types of young people. So the data, you know, despite the short length of the survey, I think you'll agree it really captured lots of really useful information about um, the experience um, of young people during the pandemic. We're going to focus on just a few aspects of this, but there's lots of other information that's available in the surveys and the data are available um, through the Irish Social Science Data Archive if people are interested in, in probing uh, the data a little bit more. Um, so the data focused on, in the first instance, disruption to employment, education um, and social activities. And Ema and I are going to speak a little bit more um, about some of the detail that came out um, from these uh, questions. There's also lots of information as well around health behaviours um, and well-being. And again, obviously, that's a big focus um, of this report. There's also information on changes to financial situation, living arrangements, and then sort of the more direct aspects of COVID-19, things like infection um, and where young people were getting their sources of information. So the questions then um, that we sought to answer as part of this uh, research project, I can sort of group them into three main uh, themes. The first is looking um, uh, at job loss. So we all know that, you know, quite apart from being a sort of a major public health uh, emergency, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was a major labour market shock and a really um, a severe labour market shock that hit um, uh, over a very short period of time. Uh, so we wanted to ask in this um, uh, piece of research which groups of young uh, adults were more likely uh, to experience job loss. We know from sort of national data from the Central Statistics Office that young people were much more affected by, by job loss, but I suppose the beauty of GUI is that we can probe uh, um, the types of young people and whether there were particular groups that were more exposed to job loss um, as a result of the pandemic. We can also then look at uh, the consequences of job loss uh, for their well-being. So sort of link it to the mental health and well-being data that we have collected as part of the COVID surveys. Secondly, then we, we wanted to look at um, sort of broader disruption to lives and not just their sort of employment disruption, but also disruption to education um, and social activities. Um, so about two thirds of the cohort were um, uh, in education at the time of the survey, um, and they were still uh, largely engaged in sort of online learning at this time. So 
we could really probe here about how the pandemic impacted um, on young adults' educational ex experiences, and then subsequently as well, I suppose, how it impacted on their social activities, their contact with their friends and families, their engagement in other activities such as sports um, and cultural activities. And then finally, um, and I suppose importantly for this piece of research and this report here today, is um, probing the impact on their mental health and uh, mental health and well-being. So, firstly, we asked which groups of young adults experienced an increase um, in depressive symptoms between 20 and 22 years of age. Again, the advantage of growing up in Ireland is that we have a consistently measured um, uh, uh, indicator of mental health and well-being um, at 20 and 22. So we can look at how that changed um, for our cohort. Um, and then I suppose really importantly for policy purposes is we can try and probe what aspects of the pandemic experience um, had the greatest impact on the prevalence and also the change in mental health and well-being. Were there protective factors? Were there risk factors? Did they differ across different cohorts um, of that population? Okay, so I'm going to start um, first with the findings in relation to uh, job loss. Um, so I suppose it's worth pointing out, first of all, you know, um, what uh, proportion of young people were actually at work um, before the pandemic hit in February 2020. Another advantage of growing up in Ireland as well is that we can distinguish young adults who were engaged in sort of what we would term sort of their main uh, job, you know, their main activity was working, as opposed to those who were combining um, education and, uh, and let's say term time work is what we would um, call it here. So in February 2020, 47% um, of the cohort were in full-time education um, and a further 16% of them were in full-time education, but also working as well uh, part-time. 32% um, so just under a third were in employment and um, were assuming that they're working full-time, uh, but really I suppose their, their main activity is classed as employment. And there was a relatively uh, smaller pro uh, proportion then of 5% who were not in um, employment, education uh, or training. So it's important just to keep these figures in mind as I go through some of the, the later um, uh, findings. Um, so of that group, about a half that were um, employed either sort of as, mid, as their main activity or else combining it um, with study, you can see here that we asked them about what sorts of disruption uh, they experienced to their uh, employment um, over those initial months of the pandemic. Um, so if you look at the, the, sort of the, the column on the right there, that you can see that just 16% of them said there was no impact. Um, so, you know, you've got nearly 85% of that group saying that there was some impact of the pandemic on their employment. Um, at this age, the big impact was losing a job. Um, so over half of them uh, lost their job as a result of the pandemic. And these are higher proportions than you see in other age groups. So if you contrast it, for example, with the parents of the cohort 08, the sort of the job loss figures there were much lower, were about a fifth. It's still very high, obviously, um, but in contrast to the 22 year olds, it's much lower. And subsequently, you'll see sort of other types of disruption in this age group were much less prevalent than they were in older adults. So things like moving to remote working, um, other sort of changes to jobs in terms of, for example, changing the hours, they were much less prevalent than losing a job, which was the major shock that this um, uh, cohort experienced. So what we can do with growing up in Ireland um, uh, is sort of probe the factors that were associated with job loss. Were there particular groups of young people that were more likely to lose their jobs as a result of the pandemic? And I suppose the beauty of GUI as well is that we can distinguish between those who were working and studying and those who had, um, you know, employment was their main status. Um, so just to sort of go back to that pie chart and just to remind you that of those that were working in February 2020, Two thirds were working as their main activity and one third were combining uh, work and study. Um, and the proportions that lost their jobs were slightly different between the two. Um, over 40% of those with a main job lost their job versus nearly 60% of those with a term uh, time job. And that likely you know, reflects the different sectors um, uh, that these uh, young people uh, were working in. So um, you'll see here in the, in, the, uh, in the table, I've sort of presented the main factors that we found that were associated or were not associated with job loss um, uh, uh, during the pandemic or the early waves, uh, the early months of the pandemic. So you'll see here, if you look at the first column in terms of the loss of the main job, 
um, there were no sort of major differences between men and women in their likelihood of losing a main job or, you know, depending on sort of family socioeconomic uh, background. And that sort of likely reflects the sort of really um, sort of major labour market shock. It was, you know, much more sectorally based than, for example, um, sort of people in lower paid jobs in certain sectors being laid off first, which we'd see perhaps in a, a more standard recession. Um, but those from lone parent families um, were much more likely uh, to report that they lost their main job. Now, this is losing a job as opposed to, you know, leaving it voluntarily, for example, to do with childcare issues. Um, but we've done a little bit more probing on this, and it looks like um, that there is an association with sort of lone parent families living in more deprived areas, and that may be driving this effect. Um, there's some suggestion as well that those who did better in their leaving search were less likely to lose their jobs. Um, and for those for whom we have information on the type of job they were doing at the age of 20, those that were in, in skilled manual uh, jobs were much more likely to lose their job and that likely reflects the, the shutdown of the construction sector. Um, there were less significant um, uh, associations in terms of losing a term time or sort of what we would say a part time job, um, but males were less likely uh, to do so. Again, likely um, that that perhaps reflects um, the sort of sectoral composition of jobs and differences between males and females. And again, the urban um, and leaving cert points um, uh, factors come out as significant here. So uh, another advantage of growing up in Ireland then as well is that we can look at sort of the broader consequences um, of job loss. So Imer will talk a little bit more about sort of the mental health um, findings, but um, one thing that we've obviously been interested in for many years at the SRI and more broadly is the, the sort of financial strain and those who report either great difficulty or difficulty in make, making uh, ends meet. Um, again, with growing up in Ireland, we can link this back to previous experience in terms of financial strain. So um, in December 2020, um, just over 11% of the cohort reported that they had difficulty or great difficulty in making ends meet. Um, if you think, I suppose, to the, 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 sort of the scale of the labour market shock that they experienced with over half of them losing uh, a job, um, that sort of increase from age 20 doesn't seem that high. Um, and I think uh, a lot of that is due to um, uh, the sort of labour market and income supports that were put in place um, uh, very early on uh, during the pandemic. But what we do see is, I suppose, the, the factors that are associated with financial strain, they really reflect the sort of um, factors that would be associated with financial strain at earlier ages. So those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, from lone parent families, and um, those who had experienced financial strain at earlier ages were much more likely to report it at the age of 22. Um, there was also some suggestion that those who were working in February 2020 and who lost their main job were more likely um, to experience financial strain. But importantly, receipt um, of the pandemic unemployment uh, payment was protective. Um, the vast majority of the cohort actually were, who had lost their jobs reported that they did um, claim the pandemic unemployment payment and this likely um, uh, cushioned um, a lot of this cohort from sort of the worst effects um, uh, of job loss. So secondly, then, as I mentioned, in terms of the research questions, we were interested in um, disruption to education and sort of broader social uh, and cultural activities among this cohort. And um, so again, if you remember back to the pie charts that I showed you, um, about two thirds of the cohort um, uh, were engaged um, in education, were in full-time education at the time uh, of the survey. Um, and in contrast, I suppose, to some of the, the emerging evidence um, and the evidence actually that's been coming out um, more recently, there's been relatively little research on the effects of disruption to further um, and higher education. Um, at the time of the survey, um, despite the fact that um, primary and secondary education was back in person uh, before um, being closed again after Christmas of 2020, um, higher education institutions were continuing to, uh, to provide remote learning. So the survey asked about sort of three aspects of their experience. Firstly, it asked about conditions for learning. So these are things like, do they have enough um, adequate broadband, a quiet place to study? Secondly, it asked about contact with educational institutions, so whether live or online classes were provided. And then thirdly, it asked about sort of broader learning experiences. So taking first sort of home conditions um, for learning, you'll see here that um, if you look at the sort of the bottom um, uh, bar, 
you'll see that the vast majority of the cohort reported that they had access to a laptop or a PC um, uh, uh, to study. Um, and this is much higher than it was for the 12-year-olds the um, uh, as part of the 08 cohort um, uh, who were likely to be sharing um, with, with siblings or with other um, members of the household. Um, but only about 50% of them said it was always true that they had adequate broadband um, and a quiet place um, uh, to study. So, you know, um, significant, I think, um, proportions here who didn't have, I suppose, um, ideal conditions um, uh, for home learning. Secondly, then we asked about various sort of um, uh, provision that was put um, aside in terms of their educational institutions. Um, and you'll see here that the, the majority um, said that it was always true that they um, had access to live online classes, but a, a much smaller proportion, so less than a third received sort of regular feedback um, on their work um, and or were sent uh, sort of links to online resources. Um, I suppose reflecting the nature of the, the shutdowns, um, uh, only 10% of them um, had access to on campus classes um, during the sort of the early waves of the pandemic. Um, and about a third um, said that it was always true that they had regular contact with, um, with classmates. So these are pretty, um, you know, um, major disruptions um, uh, to their educational um, experiences. And then finally, we asked them to sort of tick all of these things that apply in relation to their sort of broader learning experience during the pandemic. And you'll see here again that about 80% of them said that there were, you know, something um, that was different about their learning experience during the pandemic with the vast majority, you know, um, saying that it was uh, difficult to study um, and other aspects of sort of disruption were, were important here as well, such so as things like not getting to do work experience um, uh, or didn't, not doing as well um, during exams. So I'll hand over to Emer now, who's going to probe uh, a little bit more about the social activities and mental health. Thanks, Anne. Um, as Anne said, there has been significant impact on employment and education, but we also see very significant impact on day-to-day -day activities. In particular, we see a reduction in face-to-face -face contact with friends from before the pandemic. This was the case for four-fifths of the group. And that's quite remarkable given that restrictions were easing at the time of the survey, so it was actually more possible to visit than had been previously. We also see that there is a very significant minority who have kind of curtailed their involvement in sports and physical exercise, uh, who have cut back on their involvement in organized cultural activities like music or drama, and a significant group who are spending less time outdoors. We also see a shift in um, kind of engagement in some less healthy activities. And if you push on the screen, we see uh, uh, two thirds engaged more uh, than before the pandemic in informal screen time. So that's screen time that didn't involve studying or working. A uh, very significant group were eating more uh, junk food or sweets. But interestingly, we saw a, a significant reduction in alcohol consumption among these young people. And that seemed to be driven by the link between alcohol consumption and uh, you know, drinking with friends at the age of 20. So when the contact with friends reduced, then we see a, a reduction in, in the alcohol consumption. Though a small group did increase their consumption. So as the minister has highlighted, one of the starkest findings relates to the increase in the proportion of young adults over the depression threshold. When we conducted the wave at 20 years of age, we already found those levels concerning when 22% of men and 31% of, of women were over the depression threshold on an internationally validated scale. But that really leapt up um, in, during the pandemic to 41% of men and 55% of women. Now, I want to get a little behind those patterns to talk a little bit more about what factors were associated with that increase in depression. And because we found that men and women responded to different factors and different factors protected them against depression. I'm going to look at separately at male and female patterns, though there are some commonalities. Overall, and this would be in keeping with international uh, research as well, we find 
that those who are more vulnerable before the pandemic suffered more in many ways. So if they were in a family that was under financial strain two years previously, if they were not in education, employment or, or training, um, or they were combining work and study prior to the pandemic. Also, prior depression was a, a risk factor for depression during the pandemic. Both men and women uh, who reported difficulty studying experienced an increase in depression symptoms. But the response to employment was a little bit different. So men who lost their main job were more likely to become depressed, uh, while for women working remotely, even though only a small group shifted to remote working, but for that group, it was protective against uh, deteriorating mental health factors. So turning to family and, and peer factors, again, we see a, a strong gender difference in how this panned out. For both, less contact with a boy or girlfriend was associated with greater mental health difficulties. Uh, for men, feeling they could rely on friends um, measured prior to the pandemic or confiding in, in their girlfriend or boyfriend about personal feelings. All of those contributed to lower mental health risks. We actually find a quite nuanced picture for women. Uh, in fact, those who were relying on their friends prior to the pandemic were more exposed to mental health difficulties. And that seems to be because women were much more responsive to the lack of contact with friends, lack of face-to-face -face contact with friends. And even though online contact increased and phone contact increased, this didn't compensate for the, the reduced contact. For women, for not, but not for men, family relationships were also key. So if they got on better with their family, and in particular, if they confided in their father about personal feelings, they fared better in terms of mental health over the pandemic period. We also see a relationship with social activities and risky behavior. Um, for, for both, spending less time outdoors and drinking more was linked to poorer mental health, as was spending more time on, online. So having more screen time. For men, being involved in team sports uh, played a protective role, but where they curtailed that activity during the pandemic, they tended to fare more poorly. For women, eating more junk food or sweets was associated with poorer mental health. And for both men and women, have, feeling better about yourself, having higher self-esteem when you were 20, helped to protect a little bit against the, the, the mental health effects of the COVID pandemic. Now to draw some of this together, what we find is very high prevalence of depressive symptoms during the pandemic, especially among women and those who are already vulnerable in terms of families under financial strain or not in education, employment or training. And this increase in depression was clearly linked to the disruptions this group experienced in terms of their education, employment and social activities. But we find that women and men react differently to the experiences, so there are different risk and protective factors. We also see the importance of the pandemic employment supports for this cohort in that it cushioned them uh, against a large scale increase in financial strain. In terms of the implications for policy then, we see variable access to learning resources and institutional supports for students. And that really highlights the importance of an accelerated rollout of high quality broadband and supports for institutions in incorporating remote or hybrid learning, feedback and assessment into, into courses. As I mentioned, loss of face-to-face -face contact with friends was not made up for by online contact. Um, and really, if we're moving into a more hybrid world of studying and working, that has effects that have to be factored in. What are we losing by working or, or studying remotely? Uh, and how can we make up for that loss in young adults' lives? Now, we've seen from previous research that major transitions, for example, the, the move from school to college, is often associated with disruption to engagement in sports and cultural activities. So there is a risk we feel that young adults may not re-engage in sports and cultural activities to the same extent after the disruption of the pandemic, which highlights the ongoing importance of policy efforts to encourage such involvement. There is a potential for broader health promotion, so helping young people to reduce their drinking, smoking and a healthy diet to have a positive spillover effect on mental health difficulties, as we see these two aspects of their lives are closely inter interlinked. 
But as stressed by the minister, the pandemic has a serious challenges for mental health difficulties among young adults. It's lengthened already long waiting lists for mental health services in Ireland. And there is a real risk that we will see a scarring effect for young adults, especially as they make key transitions to employment and to independent households. So all of this highlights the urgency of supports uh, at community and even at college level, uh, given the scale of the mental health difficulties that they are experiencing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emer and Anne. That was incredibly comprehensive and you did a huge amount in, in, in a relatively short period of time. Um, and, and, and the detail in terms of some of the nuances of those experiences and, and, and the implications of that for protective strategies are, are really significant. I'm going to hand straight over to Keith. Uh, Keith, that's no easy challenge for you in terms of considering some of the policy implications, but we're really delighted to have you with us today to speak about your perspectives from the further and higher education uh, side of the house. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, really, really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, for today's launch. And um, thanks particularly to, to Anne and Emer for a really clear and impactful report. Um, but also thanks to, to all the young people uh, who participated in the, in the survey. Um, some of the issues that are touched on in the work are, are really just deeply sensitive. Mental health, people's finances, their social activities, uh, their personal relationships, and, and the openness and honesty of the participants has really allowed us to get some, some very important insights which can inform policy and it behooves us to, to think carefully about those policy implications, I think. I think that the starting point for me, in, in reading the report, uh, was a line uh, from the report itself. Um, the pandemic, rather than being a great leveller, uh, has exacerbated existing inequalities across society by age, gender, socioeconomic background, ethnicity, geography, etc. Um, and I think with that in mind, we need to be constantly um, alert to the longer term implications of the, this disrupted transition on the life chances of young people. Uh, we, we, we spend a lot of time, I think, talking about the, the impact of long COVID in health terms, and, and we certainly need to be alive to the concept that there might be a similar long COVID impact on other dimensions of people's lives. The report certainly identifies potential scarring effects, particularly those who are not in employment, education or training. We need to be alive to that. And I think this really speaks to the strength of the, the sort of the longitudinal approach of growing up in Ireland, that it, that it will allow us to look again at these issues um, and, and to, to see what those longer term implications are. But I think from a policy perspective, just as surely as the pandemic exacerbated inequalities and challenges, it also revealed them uh, sometimes in a very stark way. So I think it's important that we don't just box this off as a piece of research from a particular time, particular place, a particular set of circumstances. I think that the findings of this report have wider and longer lasting implications, particularly uh, in, a, in a world where we're, we're moving to a more hybrid environment. Um, certainly for us in the Department of Further and Higher Education, and particularly the, the colleagues, William Bodesang and Orla Lynch, who led our, our engagement with the sector, I think the, the rapid move to online learning gave us more insight than ever into the challenges that many students have in their home lives and their living conditions. And these are things that we, we can't unlearn and will have to bear on our thinking and policy making into the future. So this is a this is a very rich report, um, as you saw from from both Anna and Emer's presentations, and I wouldn't be doing it justice to try and respond to every point it raises. So in the next couple of minutes, I just wanted to focus on a on a couple of areas, um, um, of policy, which have particular relevance to to us here in, in the Department of Further and Higher Education, Research, Innovation, and Science, but also have touch on some of the, the wider implications. The three issues I'd like to focus on are first, what what this told us about disadvantage and including the digital divide and what that means for policy going forward. The learnings from the study and from COVID generally on inclusive learning environments and pathways. And thirdly, to focus on something which the, the minister uh, referenced uh, very significantly in his intervention, uh, but uh, that really is one of the most striking uh, features of the report, and that's the mental health issues uh, among young people, particularly as I say, in, in education and training, but also more widely. Maybe to start with the, the issue of disadvantage, including digital divide. Um, the study is very clear that over half learners found it difficult to study 
while learning remotely. In many cases, due to the unsuitability of their home environment. And this is surely not just a COVID experience. Um, and it makes us think about, well, what, what do we need to think about uh, in terms of facilities and um, uh, policies, uh, both from a national perspective, but also from a, a, an institutional perspective to help um, students to, to meet the, 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 the capacity to, to learn in the most effective way. Um, in the earliest phase of the pandemic, access to laptops and learning devices was, was a major issue. And the government working in partnership with, with higher and further education providers provided over 15,000 laptops to students in those initial months. And the fact that the study indicated access to devices wasn't a major issue is probably in part as a result of this early intervention. However, the study does indicate that the problems associated with broadband connectivity were longer lasting and continue to be a challenge. In part, there was an attempt to ameliorate this through technical solutions such as EduRome, which facilitated access to Wi-Fi for students and learners at over 200 locations. In part, it was about looking at, well, what are the criteria for our student assistance schemes to allow those most in need to pay for broadband con connectivity? But it's very difficult to argue with the conclusion in the survey uh, that, that there's a huge importance to the, to the rollout of broadband connectivity. Um, there's also a lot of thinking to be done, again, as highlighted in the study, on how hybrid models of learning uh, will evolve as a result of digital transformation over the coming years. And I think the, the sort of the reflection in, in the report, and admittedly, this was at a, a point in time, and I think things certainly evolved and changed over the course of the pandemic. But the idea that it's not just about online classes, but that connectivity and how you build the sort of the connection with, with learners, I think is really important. Um, there's also a, a, a skills point here, I think. Um, for example, the National Adult Literacy for All strategy identifies that almost one in two adults in Ireland lack basic digital skills. One might imagine that the proportions are, are different in, in the younger cohort, but equally, um, you know, this is an increasingly critical issue um, for all students. And so you might imagine that for young people who are not in employment, education or training, or those who come from particular backgrounds, such as out of care or for migrant examples, might have a, a worse experience of those digital skills. So it does, it does compel us to think about in this hybrid era, era that we, we're, we're going to be going into, where online is going to play a much more important part, um, how we support those, those people who are into the formal learning system and in developing those, those uh, digital skills, which are going to be so important. Um, the study also makes a separate skills point in noting the challenges in developing some of the types of skills and competences, for example, related to collaboration in the fully online environment of the, of the pandemic. And I think this is something that will play out for us in a further and higher education system, but it's also going to play out for employers and anyone else who's interested in learning. This is a very different environment that we're going to be facing and how do we support our colleagues particularly those at the early first stages of their career in terms of building up collaboration and connectivity. Um, and that has a, a, an impact not just on their capabilities to do their job, but also as we've seen in terms of things like uh, mental health issues. So I think that's a really important, really important thing that all, all of us as, uh, as employers, as educators uh, are gonna need to think about. Second point I wanna mention is around um, to take, take forward that point around hybrid learning um, in, in the future. And what, one of the really striking things that, that became clear to us during the pandemic was that for at least a cohort of people, the online learning experience was actually a preferable one to the classroom learning experience. We heard from a wide variety of people, for example, those with autoimmune conditions, autistic students, learners who were deaf and hard of hearing, among others, saying that there were elements of the long line learning experience which significantly benefited them and cautioned against rushing back to pre-COVID normality without taking stock of what worked. The same is true uh, for those, for example, with caring responsibilities for whom the asynchronous learning uh, environment online allowed them to study around their caring responsibilities. That's not to say that these learning experiences were, were optimal. Um, for example, students uh, who were deaf or hard of hearing were identifying issues with the technology used that, that let's say, 
appropriate captioning. However, it does raise a, a couple of uh, significant uh, policy issues which, which we're continuing to look at. First of all, is the need to think about learning environments from the perspective of universal design. And this is gonna be a key part of our forthcoming national access plan on, on accessing higher education. And it also informed plans which were announced uh, a couple of weeks ago by Minister Harris to support universal design and inclusive practices in higher education campuses. So when we are designing these hybrid environments, we need to think about them um, as a starting point that they're accept, uh, accessible to everybody um, and uh, think about the, the experiences of people uh, for whom this, this really was valuable. But the second point I think that we need to think about is how we support flexible learning pathways for people. We know, for example, that part-time learning and hybrid solutions uh, really can work for people, for example, and parents. But it's a fact that our supports for students, such as SUSE, the student grant system, are not set up to support learners in that way. So for us in the Department of Further and Higher Education, as we think about implementing a new funding reform framework for higher education, the issue of part-time education, online learning, hybrid learning in ways that work around people's lives, I think are something that's gonna to have to be a real focus of our engagement and policy over the next few years. The, the third um, and final policy issue I wanted to draw out is something that's covered very well um, in today's study and one that the minister picked up very significantly in his intervention, and that's the mental health implications of the, the disruptive uh, transition. And you know, I don't need to go over it again because Iman Ann have covered it so well, but those are very striking findings about the proportions of men and women um, who were meeting or exceeding the threshold for clinically significant depression. As a system, we've put an emphasis on investing in mental health um, and well-being supports during the pandemic. We've provided additional support such as student counsellors, psychologists, training and implementation of appropriate frameworks, in, in, in particularly in higher education. Um, and also of relevance in that context, particularly the, the, given the, the, the report's findings around well-being um, are and, and things like the importance of sport for people and, and, and outdoors activities is, is support for things like healthy campus initiatives. However, it's, it's probably fair to say that these supports aren't universally and consistently available to all people in the age cohort um, uh, and even perhaps in different parts of the education and training system, not to mention those who are, who are not in education uh, or employment. And it's also the fact that, as the study notes, there's a correlation between early school living and poor mental health, and so potentially those most susceptible to these challenges may have the least access to supports through educational employment. That's why the, the investments are being made on mental health that the Minister referenced in his intervention, uh, as well as the cross-governmental work on, on youth mental health pathfinders, will be so critical. Um, a, a critical indicator of future policy challenges is contained in the report when it notes that the the longer term move to remote and hybrid work and study prevents a challenge to all of us in society. Um, and we need to think about mental health, we need to think about overall healthy strategies which can counteract the negative coping strategies that are identified in the report smoking, drinking, junk food consumption. And I think for, for us as policymakers, what this means is it's incumbent on us not to take a narrow approach in formulating policies and strategies. And so as someone involved in higher education policy, maybe 20 years ago, we would have been very, very focused just on the sort of mechanics of, of education. And I don't think that that works anymore. And um, I think for all of us who engage in a policy area, we need to think about um, the broader view and how we capture issues such as mental health and well-being when we're thinking about our overall policy formulation, not just the sort of the deliverables uh, of, of a specific sectoral area. And I think what will certainly help um, with that continued focus um, is the sort of work that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that this study is an example of giving us insights into young people, is to thinking about how we continue to give um, people a voice in policy making and to help to make sure that they're shaping the policies that matter to them, something that Department of Children and Quality, Disability, Integration and Youth uh, lead on um, in, in terms of examples of, 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 of uh, building youth voices into, into policy making and something which all departments who have responsibilities in this area need to, to think about. 
final point I just wanted to make was, was first to thank both the SRI, Department of Children, Quality, Disability, Integration and Youth, Trinity and the CSO, but the, the, those involved in the growing up in Ireland, so the itself, I mean, this just continues to be a massively important source of evidence for policy. Um, and as a department with responsibilities cross-cutting for, uh, for research policy, it just really is heartening to see investment in research like this yield uh, continued impact uh, in policy terms. And just we'll continue to see that through the course of this, this really, really important longitudinal study. For me, uh, reading this report was, was, uh, was a prompt for things that I'm going to be thinking about in, in, in work in terms of the issues that it's raised. Uh, it's just a great example of, of how research can, can influence policy. So I want to thank everyone involved and to thank you for the opportunity to, to make some observations today. Thanks very much, Emma. Thank you very much, Keith. And for those words at the end, I mean, uh, growing up in Ireland is something we're obviously immensely proud of. And I think what you, you've hit upon there in terms of the, the impact that it has uh, on policy, but also at the beginning for your focus on the young people who are involved in this, because, you know, without them, obviously, there, there, is, there is no study. Um, very struck by the, the range of comments you made, but I'm, I'm going to uh, sit sit on my my instinct to to engage with them and, and and if people will beg our forgiveness we might just take take an extra couple of minutes from your lunch break uh, uh, and address some of the questions that have been raised and I know Emer's already been busy answering some of them and there was one there about about you know people who who did well during COVID perhaps and what we need to learn from from that and uh, and I saw I saw uh, Emer you pointed out that that for a small number at who who had experienced depressive symptoms at twenty actually we're doing better um, a little bit later but it's, it's obviously given the numbers are so small hard hard to see but also I thought it was really interesting you mentioned that while while overall people said they did a little bit worse in higher education that the dropout rates right rates were, were relatively low so there is something in there around what we can learn learn from the positive uh, both in terms of perhaps the employment environment but also uh, as well as the as well as what's protective um, just to come back to that question around the depression of symptoms, because that's obviously one of the most striking things uh, from the report. Emer, I have a question here about um, the extent to which that resonates with the international experience. Is the experience in Ireland quite consistent with what's happening in other countries, from what we know? Um, and, and, and granted, we, we may not have have as rich data necessarily in all contexts, but also we had seen an increase in depressive symptoms at that age 20 stage. So there is something of a pattern here. And, and, and if you wanted to add anything more on that about, is, is, is there a worrying pattern? Is there something positive in terms of people's awareness and being able to articulate their needs or, or, or what you think that the policy implications of that might be? I think there was already a concern at 20 at the levels we saw, and we know from the My World survey as well, that they had found an increase over time in uh, depression, anxiety symptoms. Um, if you look at the international literature, especially that the literature that's based on good cohort studies like GUI, you do see a kind of pattern of increase among adults of, of different uh, age groups in mental health difficulties. So. It is consistent, but um, it's very difficult to pin down exactly that, that age group. Um, interestingly, the only group for whom we have comparable data in Ireland are the tilde, so the older age cohort, and they saw a very significant increase in, in depressive symptoms using the same measure, but a different cutoff. But for the young adults, they're almost twice as high the level during the pandemic as it was among the older people during the, the first months of the pandemic. So while it, it might be coming out in other countries, I think it's, it is a real issue for Ireland to tackle with in, in policy terms. And I think Keith's uh, points about um, taking a holistic approach to education and, and incorporating well-being is very important. And I think relationships and connections are, are kind of key to that. So it's, it's trying to find a way of balancing those relationships and, and connections with flexibility to engage in at least some hybrid or remote learning, that would be the challenge. But but the scale is concerning, uh, especially as these right colleagues have done work on uh, adult mental health services prior to the pandemic and the level of unmet need there 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Ema. I mean, it's, cer it's certainly very stark. And I think one of the strengths in your presentation was to give us a little bit of more, a more granular analysis of what, what was protected for men and women and the, and the quite different experiences, actually, sometimes. And, and Keith, that resonated for me when you spoke about universal design and the challenge of universal design and being able to take all of that into account. Emer, you, you particularly emphasized, and it, and it was clear in your presentation as well, about the importance of relationships and connections. Uh, and Keith mentioned, you know, what, what can we learn from this about a hybrid world and, and hybrid working environments going forward? And I was wondering what, what you'd emphasize in terms of the policy impacts on the employment side, because there's obviously quite a different context there in terms of people entering, uh, starting their careers, entering the labor market uh, versus perhaps those of us who are a little bit further along and, and may have just a different relationship with hybrid work and, and what you think we need to do in that space. Yeah, like I think the I think the policy implications, there's sort of there are two themes that sort of uh, strike me when we think about the, the impact of the pandemic on the labor market um, situation of, of this cohort. And I think the first is, um, I suppose, the the particular aspects of the pandemic and the um, labor market and employment supports that were put in place to deal with this particular shock. So you'll see from our research, you know, that the pandemic employment payment really cushions young people and it also cushions the population at large from sort of the you know the major sort of financial strain impacts of the pandemic but I think more broadly there's a lot that we can learn from sort of previous recessions and previous labour market shocks in terms of the particular um, difficulties that young people face when uh, number one let's say they get unemployed earlier in their careers and or they enter the labour market during a major labour market shock and we know from previous recessions that both of those can be hugely damaging to young people and they take much longer to recover from it um, and there's longer term scarring effects. So I think in terms of the policy implications, I think there is a real need um, uh, to focus on this group. So whether that be through sort of um, re-education, further training, you know, there were particular sectors that were very much affected by the pandemic there may be major changes in how they work so you know some of them may be moving much more towards hybrid and I suppose the training and education that people may have had prior to the pandemic may not be appropriate for the sort of the lives that they're going to lead in terms of their careers so I think that sort of focus on retraining and, and re-education will be really crucial uh, for this group and then I think also we didn't really sort of touch on it in the presentation, but you will have seen there the, the numbers there of um, the, the cohorts that were not in education, employment or training. And you will have seen, you know, that they were vulnerable right through in terms of all of the outcomes that we were looking at. Keith also mentioned it in terms of, you know, the response in terms of mental health supports, that there's a danger that they slip through the cracks in terms of, you know, the settings in which people get these supports. So I think you know, focusing on that group uh, um, will be really crucial. And again, we know from previous pandemics or not from previous pandemics, from previous recessions, um, that those, that group, um, I think, um, it hadn't actually, you know, um, uh, recovered in terms of the proportion. But once people get into that, you know, they sort of stay in it and it's, um, it's much more difficult to get them back uh, into the labour market or into further education and training. So I think, a focus on that um, vulnerable group would be really crucial here too. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I think that, yeah, that concept of scarring that's often used in the labour market, but I think what we're looking at here also is that that potential across not only in terms of the longer term mental health outlook, but also social activities. And Emer, you'd raise that, you know, are, are we going to see people re-engage to the extent that we would have expected in, in terms of in terms of the trajectories and keeping an eye on all of that and I suppose that's why why we think collecting data from this cohort now at age 25 next year is going to be so very significant in terms of being able to uh, get a sense of the recovery that has happened and, and who is not managing to recovery uh, recover and, and, and what that means. I'm very conscious that we are now eating into people's lunch break and uh, uh, and I don't know about anybody else, but uh, but certainly that can that can interrupt concentration. Um, so I just want to thank very much our uh, the minister again for launching the report, but Emer and Anne and, and their colleagues, particularly for for all the work that goes into something like this, because it is uh, it is of uh, enormous significance. And Keith as well for for coming along and thinking so uh, reflectively on the pop 
potential implications and and certainly some of the concepts you use around social long COVID. I mean, that's, I, th I think I think you've raised several dimensions here that uh, clearly have impact in terms of your own work, but I think are very relevant across across the policy system. So thank you again and thank you to all our participants for coming along and for your questions and uh, and we'll see you again soon.